Um, I want to introduce you. If you weren't here last night, uh, you missed for whatever reason. This is my wife, Rochelle, if you like to roll your R's. Um, if you can't tell, I've had plenty of coffee. I've been up long enough, and it's going to be a wild ride, so keep your helmets on. Um, and I'm going to give you this. Switch over here. Oh, look at that. What a helpmate. This Right? Yeah. Check one, two. All right. Here we go. Um, this morning, as we set off into this next bit of time together, we're going to be focusing in on specific roles that are unique to being a husband and then unique roles and responsibilities and callings of what it is to be a wife. Uh, something we kind of hinted at and touched on last night was that these are not just words given as a title, maybe the way you would put it on the door of an office, president, vice president, assistant, but these are descriptive words of our calling. There's actually actions tied to them, convictions that go along with them. And everything Pastor Mark shared, it is so important to realize these are some of those areas that you can be anticipating the Holy Spirit to lead you in. That these are the areas that I often am expecting the Lord to come through the front door. Now, sometimes he'll surprise you and come through the back door and get you in an area you thought you either didn't need to attend to, you thought everything was fine, and God has to spin you around and catch you by surprise. But the things we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes together are the areas as you look towards the front door of your home, your life, you can anticipate God coming into these uh, topics of discussion for us as men and husbands. And then ladies, you can be watching because these are some areas that God's going to speak to you, lead you, strengthen you, and work through you in. Uh, before we get into them, we wanna, we're going to pray. Um, but before we pray, just want to share something this morning. W went for a walk and was talking and praying. And um, I've never really thought through this before, but I want to encourage you guys maybe in the next week to go read through specifically marriage minded, read through Matthew chapter five and the Beatitudes. Just, just write that down for later. But the promises that come through the Beatitudes, those who are poor in spirit, we're not haughty and puffed up. Those who are meek, those who are broken, those who are in need, those who are going through difficult times, persecution. Sometimes within marriage, it feels like we're being persecuted by our spouse. But the promises that come to that is the nearness and the power of God that he will absolutely carry you through and cause you to flourish. And so just to read through and pray through specifically with your marriage in mind, the Beatitudes this week, I pray that is something of the Lord. Uh, and then as we were talking or thinking through that this morning, um, it's not fair often because what you see on Sundays or what you see in conferences or what you hear, I know last night, Mark and Veronica were talking about the friendship they have and it's, it's overflowing, oh, our friendship, our friendship, our friendship. And yet without knowing the testimony of how they got to a place of having that friendship. And then Pastor Mark alluded today and they touched on some different things last night. And it's an area that the Lord had to convict me of that I stopped being my wife's friend at one point. I might've been her husband, but I was not her friend. If there was an issue, I would have been gentle with a friend, but not as gentle with my wife. I would have been caring and like, tell me more about that with a friend, but I wouldn't have done that with my wife. I would put up with annoyances from a friend that maybe I wouldn't put up with from my wife. And the Lord had to deeply convict me. And I remember within 48 hours, I don't know if you remember this. I remember, yo, you do, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, you can clap. You're, you're going to get it in a minute here, I promise. Um, but I remember within 48 hours, I had, I had come in from the porch. The Lord had told me, you've stopped being her friend. And came inside, and within minutes, I, I remember standing across the living room. This wasn't like a, hey, I need to talk to you. This was very far away. I need to apologize. Now, ladies, when you hear your husband say, I need to apologize, you're like, oh, great. First of all, we don't say things like that, so this must be really bad. And second of all, what is it? And I remember just saying, we've st I've stopped being your friend. And within 48 hours, the Lord began to do something absolutely transformational. And we have a, a joke, even now, sometimes we'll say stuff. And you know when you have something that you have to say, but it's also going to start a fight? 
You're like, huh, I have to say it, but it's probably going to go wrong. And for us, something that we've learned in that moment was, hey, can I say something as your friend? Because don't we let friends say things to us directly? But if then if our spouse says it, we get all wound up somehow as if it's not fair. It should be the other way around. Our spouse should be able to say whatever it is that the Lord's stirring in their heart because they have a better perspective of us than anybody does. And so now we have this kind of bantering thing. If we're going to bring something up that could be confrontation, like, hey, can I say something as your friend? And it's like, okay, so disarming, so fun. But anyways, so scary. So scary. <laughs> it's, it's good for me, at least. I don't know. But let's pray, and we're going to get into this stuff. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of things, and then we're going to go back and forth. I'll back off and let her run for a minute, talk to the lady stuff. You can, but then you can't cut me off if you turn it off. Okay, All right. Let's pray. Oh, my Lord, we just confess our frailty. Lord, that we fall short every day. And yet your grace and your mercy, it endures to all generations. And so, Lord, we want to stand in that today. That we would walk in mercy and, Lord, we would receive the grace that has been so freely given. Lord, that your spirit would convict us where we need convicting, encourage, exhort, strengthen the areas that have just been unattended to. Knock the dust off the important things that have been neglected. And Lord, help us crucify the flesh wherever it may still exist. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Uh, Something I read the other day, it said, you know, Using chopsticks looks really easy until you try it. And marriage is kind of the same way, right? Before you got married, you're like, we could do this. We could probably do this better than anybody else. And for us, our first year, we didn't fight over Colgate. Uh, We didn't toothbrush. We just bought whatever we wanted and we were in bliss. We had probably 15 different kinds of cereal on the top of the fridge. Uh, we, We went for it. It was awesome. But for us, you're six or seven. Five. 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 It came that quick, huh? <laughs> that was not. Well, maybe I was unaware in year five. <laughs> was I was very aware. Very aware. <laughs> but you know, no one tells you what you may have to endure. And I remember sitting there, we were in the car. The kids were very young. You're exhausted. And I remember we had come to a point where you didn't have a bad day or week or month, but you'd had a bad year. And as hard as that is in life, try doing that while on staff at a church, trying to be an example to people. And we weren't yelling or abusing. There wasn't adultery, but there was that space that Pastor Mark had alluded to and a growing callousness towards the other person's needs. And so not only was there distance, but there was the hardening of heart. And it would even come to the point of being able to say, look, I'm going to love you, but I don't like you. And the other person, remember saying back, well, that's okay. I'm going to love you, but I don't like you either. (laughs) What do you do with that? Where do you go from there? Until you go to the cross, you'll stay in it. But once you go to the cross the Lord will begin to peel away the callus, begin to soften the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh that'll beat again for one another. He really will. And so maybe you hear about friendship and excitement or you'll see friendly banter or, or, wow, they have such a great marriage. I, I I believe we do. It was fun last night, right? She could see it in my eyes that I was gonna maybe not do the foot washing thing. Um, Now, I I was pretty sure I was going to because we have to look all of you in the face. But um, got home, it was like 11 o'clock at night. She was still working on some things for this morning. And she could just see in my eyes that I was maybe contemplating not doing it. And as a wonderful helpmate that rescues you and saves you, she's like, don't even think about it. And I was like, okay. I will tell on you. Yeah, she'll tell on me. That's what she said. I was like, oh my gosh. But what was really neat was at the end of that, We needed a reset too. I mean, it wasn't huge. It wasn't a monster mental moment. I'm sure at some point it may drift off into the distance of our memory and be hard to recall. But how sweet to be brought back to a place 
where you're focused on who you are in the Lord as one. And so a couple of things I want to share to lay the groundwork, and then we'll get into it. Um, but Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, we've been talking about this, that God made them male and female. It was the whole point of his creation. He knew what he was doing. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. It's a bit of a mystery on one hand, but then a bit of understanding on the other. We can at least wrap our minds around it's not what she thinks is right, and it's not what I think is right. We come under the lordship and the mind of Christ. And now look, I, I'm going to do my best. I don't know what it is. There's nothing better than the Bible other than the author himself. But there's some serious things I think that are worth addressing. And so in the nature of being the family of God, can we just have a family talk for the next little bit? And so I'll say some things, but look, I'm just going to make you argue with the Lord if you want to argue with anyone at all. And, and I want to say just a tiny, tiny little precursor. Uh, as we address some of these topics, we are very, very aware that they would sound different if you're living in a home where abuse actually exists. Now, abuse is a word that's wildly manipulated, has been broadened way too far these days. If someone's not nice, it's abuse. No, they just need to go for a prayer walk. But if there's actual violence or actual manipulation, actual abuse going on, please do all that you can to hear this in the voice of your loving father in heaven, not in the experience of corrupted experiences and sin on earth. Does that make sense? And so if anything falls funny or creates fear, it shouldn't. It should give hope. Now, gentlemen, I, I'm going to be as blatantly clear as I can because uh, I don't know about you, but my experience is guys don't read between the lines very well. We just don't. And girls, they just talk circles forever. I'm like, what are you saying? <laughs> Not you. Right. Let's just make that clear. <laughs> just in general. No, no. <laughs> but I'm going to be as blatantly, bluntly, brotherly as I can with us. I remember, I appreciate, right? In high school, there was a girl I liked. And I remember trying to get her attention. And, and she knew. And, and oh, that was, was my friend. Yeah, it was actually her friend. Yeah. This was before uh -huh. I knew Rochelle. Yeah. This is before I knew Rochelle. And uh, I remember we had finally gone on like some group date to Denny's. And on the way home, she just said, hey, just so you know, this is never going to happen. Okay. It was the coolest thing I ever heard in my life. It wasn't this like, oh, you know, they're going to ignore your phone calls for five days and they're going to knock it back to you. And they're going to, she just straight up shot it dead. And I loved it. I was like, yeah, awesome. Check that one off the box and move on. And so we're just going to address some things as clearly and bluntly as I can. Ladies, if you're like, that sounds kind of mean, it's what we need to hear. So I'm not talking to you this way. I'd be much calmer with you. But gentlemen, Psalms 128 verses 1 through 4, and we'll come back to the end, but I want you to notice the beginning. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat or you take the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine and the very heart of your house in your children like olive plants all around your table, thus shall be the man be blessed who fears the Lord. I'll tell you right now, as we touch on this topic of being a husband, you cannot fear the Lord and your wife at the same time. If you're afraid of her, 
you are failing her. We fear the Lord. Period. There are days in which that will go quite well, and there will days be coming that it's more like plowing stony ground. It is irrelevant. The farmer gets to enjoy the fruit of his labor. It just says that if we fear the Lord, she will be like a vine in the house producing and in the center of your home, this beautiful heartbeat if you fear the Lord. But if your primary fear is for the moment by moment experience with her, you will never have anything wonderful to reap. So be very careful about whom it is you yield to. You and I, this is wild. I, I, this is just going to happen. The Bible says that we will give an account for everything we've done. And someday the Lord's going to say, David, you're up. Okay. And I'm going to come in. He's like, let's talk. I'm like, let's talk. Let's talk about the most important thing I gave you. Oh, is it the church? No, I died for the church. I, the church is fine. Okay. Our kids. No, that was, we'll talk about that in a minute, but no, it's not your kids. Hmm. I want to talk to you about Rochelle. I created her fearfully and wonderfully. I handcrafted her personality and her temperament. I gave her those giftings to be used for my glory. And then I entrusted all of that to your care. I want to talk to you about how, how you were as a husband to the woman I created. And we will give an account. And don't think for a minute we can pull off what Adam tried to pull off. <laughs> well, Lord, <laughs> that woman. Nope. Didn't work then and it won't work now. If we fear the Lord, then we will reap the beautiful blessings of a healthy, vibrant home if we don't grow weary in well-doing. So we're both going to take some time. She's going to be happy and fun, and I'm going to be more fun, maybe. I'm so much more fun. She's so much more fun. <laughs> we balance each other so good. It's a blast. But I'm going to get out of the way. But gentlemen, as we start this thing off, I want to ask you to take this more seriously than you've ever taken anything before in your life. Because you will give an account for how well you husband your wife. But I'm going to go catch my breath. <laughs> Let you have a minute with the ladies. So, so scary. take it away. So scary. Okay. Um, okay, you guys, I'm going to look at Genesis 2.18 right now. Um, I got designated to find three main roles that are important for us as wives. And, of course, we can't possibly narrow it down to three, but we're going to touch on three main topics that might have a couple little, you know, sub things um, inside of them. But right now we're going to look at helpmate. Um, Genesis 2.18, it says, it is not good that man should be alone, right? I mean, come on. Um, I will make him a helper comparable to him. And I love that so much that we're called to be his helpmates. We're, it's a, the definition is a person who provided, who provides needed help or assistance, a helpmate. We were created for this specific reason. You and I were not, I mean, I think that we kind of get it wrong nowadays where we have these little girls that we raise and we're like, honey, you're going to wait around for Prince Charming and he's going to be six foot two, have dark hair, blue eyes, and he's going to drive a Porsche and he's going to have a castle on the hill and he's going to da, 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 right? And we set up our little girls to look for Prince Charming. And yet what we really need to do is realize that he was not created for me. Like, I love that God has made us in a position where I absolutely love being with him and we have fun together and all this stuff. But truly, the reason that I was created was to be David's helpmate. It's not about me. It's about what I can do to lift up and to help my husband. And with that, that comes with a pretty big responsibility. It sums, it's fun sometimes. And it's hard sometimes, right? So, but for our kids, may we just like kind of re-strategize our mind. Is that even a word? Probably not, but something like that. But if we need to just change our, our minds thinking, they're not this little passenger princess that needs to be doted on and carried on. We need to remind them that God has created them for a special purpose and that when they meet the man of their dreams, 
their calling in life is to be his helpmate first and foremost. So I love that. Um, the areas that he struggles in, you guys, don't kick him when he's down. It's our job to lift him up. Does he struggle with something? Is he like, is he hard on himself? I love my husband, but he is the hardest person. I don't need to critique him ever because he's already done it 10 times worse than I could ever do. So encourage your husband if they tend to be harder on themselves. Um, is there something that he loves? Give him the freedom to run with that. There is so much, you know, to enjoy in this life. God created us to enjoy things and to love nature and all that stuff. We do. Um, he loves backpacking. He's raised our boys to love backpacking. And we affectionately call it man packing because us girls don't pee on trees. Well, I'm sorry. It just doesn't happen in our house. <laughs> um, but I never would want to hold him back. He wants to go out with those boys. Yeah, have fun. Don't guilt trip him or hold him back. Um, allow him to have that freedom to do that. We get the privilege to help them become the man that they are meant to be and not the boys that they were when we got married. I, I know, okay, I say that. We were married at 21. Sometimes people get married a little bit later in life, but we were truly grew up together, I feel like, because 19, I think we met, right? And then 21 married. So we absolutely like have that role in each other's lives. Um, sometimes being a helpmate is not necessarily a positive experience experience when it comes like meaning you're not just always encouraging and lifting them up and having them go out and do fun things but sometimes it's coming to them in a time where you see areas and shortcomings and they're becoming somebody that's not who God created them to be and he didn't have that for them they're getting prideful or just grumpy or snappy or whatever and coming to them but before you go to them as iron sharpens iron, we know that that's our job sometimes is to come alongside and say, babe, so can we, can we have a talk as friends, right? <laughs> um, but just coming to them in a spirit and talking to them in a voice which they can receive and in a tone with which they can receive it. Sometimes as us ladies, we're in the thick of it, right? We're cleaning the house and raising the kids and changing the diapers and rushing to the grocery store and doing pickup and all that fun stuff. And if there's a correction that you see, it could come off as mothering. We're not to be their moms. They're not, they're not our fifth kid or sixth kid or whatever kid. Um, they are the man of the home. And in encouraging them, um, there is, you know, a tone in which that can be received easier than others. I love it. In Proverbs 31, 12, it says, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. And that is truly um, my favorite verse as far as being a wife. Um, and some of the examples that I've absolutely loved are the example of a helpmate is Abigail and Nabal. Write this down. It's First Samuel 25. It's way too long for us to read right now. But basically, Nabal is this fool, right? His name even means it. And he was a harsh man. He was a rich man, but he was harsh. And King David had helped tend some of his sheep. And they asked, it was like one of the suppers or a celebration. And they asked for food for their men that had helped him. And he said, who is this David? All these people rising up. I don't even know this guy. Tell him to like go away. And David was furious. And the men that were working in the fields ran back to Abigail and told her, okay, we're in for it now. They're coming after us. And in her wisdom and in being a helpmate, she saw a foolish decision and she ran to correct it. Okay. She knew not to to meet him in his folly and in his sin that he was in, but instead she ran and she became what was needed at that time. And she brought them food and bread and drink. And they, she said, please, 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 David, do not shed blood on the count of this fool. He's acting like a fool right now. Don't lower yourself to his level. And she used wisdom in that time. So that to me is an example of someone she was he didn't know he was about to go get killed, right? Because David was so mad. He was a man of war. He was about to take out their whole household. She saved their household in that. And then that's to me is a good, an example of a good helpmate is in first Samuel 25, Abigail and Nabal, but a bad helpmate in my opinion would be Ananias and Sapphira. You know, the story in the book of Acts, right? Where they go in and they say, Hey, Let's tell them that we're going to give them half of everything that we own, but we're going to keep some to the side right here for us. Now, wives, we have a perfect experience right there, right? There's something that's going to be a blessing. 
it, you don't need to lie about it. And how awesome would it have been if in that moment she would say, why in the world would you do that? But no, she went along with it, blindly following, and they both died at the end of that story in Acts chapter, I believe it was Acts chapter one. But that's just, that's so sad that Sapphira could have been that helpmate to him instead. She just went right along with a really bad idea. So yeah, there's opportunities for us to do helpful and hurtful things. Awesome. Um, I will tell you right now from the man's perspective, without our helpmate, we are failing every day. We can put on the uniform, we can flex our muscle, we can be faithful, but oh my, is it borderline impossible to actually pull off. But when you know your wife is behind you, ladies, just so you know, when you know, when a man knows his wife's got his back, he'll conquer the world. He'll do anything. And so, gentlemen, or ladies, first thing was being a helpmate. Us guys, number one thing is that you are called to lead. There's no way around it. You are called to lead. Ephesians 5, 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And so as being the head, that doesn't mean you lord over. There's a tremendous difference between lording and leading. So don't walk out of here, woman. I was told to lead, so do what I say. That is absolutely not right. You get to lead as Christ leads you. How much grace is in our lives from the Lord? Oh my gosh. How much mercy, how much patience, how many times have we needed to be able to try again? But he's always been leading. And so leading like the Lord is tempered in grace and in mercy, but we are absolutely 100% called to lead. And ladies, if your husbands know that you're willing to go, trust me, it's terrifying to be out front. When we were prayerfully figuring out what God was doing to get us here and, and all these different things, right? That was a tremendous uprooting and transformation and change. And there was a moment where we said, you know what? This is crazy. You just need to go, you just need to go talk to the Lord and come back and let me know what he's saying and I'll go and do whatever he says. Now, the overly feministic movement would rebuke her like crazy. But do you know the fear and trembling that sets in your soul when now it is your responsibility to go into your prayer time? And if this goes wrong, it's not our fault. It's mine. It's mine. If we walk off a cliff, that's my responsibility. I will have to take ownership of that. And so when she says, honey, this one, I don't have a lot of clarity or advice. You just need to go talk to the Lord and let us know. The fear and the trembling that sets in. Now, look, she's not my servant. She's my spouse. There's a huge difference. Wives, you're no one's servant. You are their spouse. But there's times to understand that he, if he understands, he has to lead. Because he's not going to give an account to you when he's in heaven. He's going to give an account to the Lord. And it's wild. And so a couple things real quick, gentlemen, in areas in which we are supposed to lead. One, we are supposed to lead spiritually. We just are. Now, if today you're like, I'm at ground zero and don't know what to do. Start with step one. If your goal is to be on top of Mount Everest tomorrow, you'll be gravely disappointed. You go, oh, well, I didn't pray. I didn't read. I didn't memorize. I didn't do all these crazy things. Well, that's okay. But did you take a step? Did you pray for dinner? If you never pray for dinner, pray for dinner tonight. If you never send her out in the morning praying, pray over her in the morning. And it'll change from time to time, but to lead spiritually. That could be a whole talk in and of itself, but Deuteronomy chapter six tells us how to lead spiritually, that it's a constant thing. 
We lead in spiritual things, but we have to lead in spiritual ways. So the character of Christ, is he working through me? Look, someone told us one time, I know there's no perfect marriages. I totally disagree. I think there are absolutely perfect marriages. You mean they don't fight? Oh no, they go for it. They just go for it the way that Christ would have them go for it. We work it out in a way that honors the Lord, but we lead spiritually. Don't avoid it anymore. And ladies, be gracious. We're trying to figure it out. Right? Now, she grew up. It was awesome. The stories that her dad would do morning, devo- morning devotions or evening devotions. D- dinner devotions. Dinner devos with the kids growing up, all that stuff. I had zero example. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know what on earth to do. I don't know how this works. And so trying to figure it out. Ladies, we're trying to figure it out. But, well, I'll save other things for some other time. Um, but if your husband is trying to figure it out, let him figure it out. Sometimes too much help is more of a weight. So we lead spiritually. We, guys, this is so wild, but we have to lead emotionally. It's like, what? What are you talking about? We just, we do. We have to lead emotionally. We don't get a free pass to just act how we want and expect them to be different. In fact, that whole friendship thing, I had realized that I was sowing into our home maybe a little bit of negativity or disappointment or disgruntledness, and then all of a sudden wondering why my home wasn't this happy, joyful place. It's like, well, look what you're sowing. You're critiquing things, you're complaining about things, you're frustrated about things, and then you're wondering why your home isn't this fruitful vine like in Psalms. Well, you're planting all the wrong stuff. And so plant joy. Plant something that's positive. Read Philippians chapter four, what is good and true and noble and lovely and worthy of report. Sow those things and you will see your family come to life. It's incredible, but we have to sow spiritually. We have to sow emotionally, which also means, I wanna warn you guys, um, don't put your wives on blast. And ladies, pick this up too. But I remember I learned this over, man, you were so patient. I can't wait to get to heaven and find out how patient you actually were. (laughs) No, look, realize this. If you see like, oh man, my wife's been gracious. You have no idea how gracious she's been. (laughs) You saw the tip of the iceberg. When you get to heaven, you'll see how gracious she was. Uh, And I see like, wow, my wife was patient. I can't wait to find out how patient she actually has been. Oh my gosh. Uh, (laughs) Good job. You deserve a trophy. But look, here's the deal. There were times, oh my gosh, she was raising our kids. We were fostering children at the same time. There was a time we had five kids, only three were our own. And the ages went, I think, seven, five, three, three, and two. Figure that out. And it all happened in a day. It was not chosen. And I was getting all frustrated, man, because she wasn't keeping up with the laundry. Like, what is wrong with you? You just worked for 14 hours. She had zero help. And you, now it was all internalized. I didn't walk around, which is almost worse. And so if I had the chance, I'd, I'd kind of sort of like honorably complain to her, her, her mom because I know mom would talk to daughter. Like you little manipulator. I know the Lord has already convicted me. It's done. I don't do that no more. Did you know I did that? You knew. We had think, actually we did have heated fellowship over limit. that. We had heated she's fellowship mine. over that. <laughs> but look, if your husband has a hard time or your wife has a hard time accomplishing something, no one needs to know. No one needs to know. If it took him ten tries to hang the, the picture level, it was crooked and there's a hole the size of a cannonball behind it. You don't need to tell the world at the next party how dumb your husband is and how many times he tried to hang it and he failed. You're humiliating him in public. And gentlemen, we don't need to do that to our wives. If we're going to lead emotionally, we need to understand what it does to people emotionally. We don't need to poke fun at them in public. We need to build them up, be their cheerleader in public. Um, we need to lead spiritually, lead emotionally. These last three are just going to hit hard. We need to lead sexually. Like, excuse me, now you're talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, which means it's not about you. When you're the leader, Amen. you know you're responsible for and the one caring for and looking after whoever's following. 
And so in the bedroom, right, she's not your servant. She's not your concubine. She's not anything other than the woman God gave to you. And so that should be a two-way road that is full of understanding and compassion. It should be enjoyed. It should be wonderful. But leading doesn't mean lording, and that includes the bedroom. Last two things you should lead in is financially. Like, well, I don't like talking to her about the finances. Doesn't matter, does it? Because you answer to the Lord. Mm. You have to. Now, I love... You've done the bills most of our marriage. You have access to all of our finances. Uh, there's been times I feel like I've been, uh, was it to him. Potiphar? No, 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 Potiphar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In that. the Bible, right? Joseph's there, and Potiphar says he doesn't even know what he has except for the food in front of him. Mm. There's times where our life has been so busy. I'm like, how much do you, I didn't even know what I made. How much do you make a year? I don't know. Lights <laughs> are on. I'm going to work. How much is in your savings account? I don't know. Now, that's negligence. I needed to learn to like occasionally look into the account. But it's beautiful because Proverbs 31 says that a woman knows how to look at land and buy and sell and trade. She's wise financially, not irreverent. So ladies, be someone who can be trusted with the finances. But gentlemen, whether they are or are not, you must lead in finances. And uh, the last one is just a note. I don't know how many of you guys are homeschooling or just dealing with school. But gentlemen, I've met a lot of dads in the homeschool world specifically who have forfeited their voice into their kids' education. Bad idea. Terrible idea. And the worst place to do that is in the world of homeschool. You don't have to be the teacher, but you need to be involved. And so we are called to lead. You are the head of the home spiritually, emotionally, sexually, financially, and any other Lee you can figure out. <laughs> All right, take it away, honey. All right, Number Proverbs two. 31, 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of his life. I'm going to keep on coming back to that because it's the best. Um, and Titus 2, verses 3 and 5, it goes over a lot, but I'm going to read it real quick. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God might not be, may not be blasphemed. And I love this so much. So our second point is going to be homemakers. Um, first is the helpmate. Second is homemakers. They all intertwine, so they will be woven together. Um, but this covers so much, and I love it because it touches on the older woman, and it touches on the younger women. So it doesn't matter what season of life you're in, you have a role. And it does change, and so go with the changes. Um, whether in this room, we're all married, right? So we're all going to be a helpmate, but we might not all be moms, like not everybody has children, but in the time that you do, um, in the season that you do have children, you are commissioned to the first thing is to love your husbands. That's first guys. And then to love your children. And for really quick for your older women, please take that season seriously of pouring into the younger women and admonishing them. It might be a do as I say, not as I did, or it might be, hey, this is how we had such a blessed life. Follow this and oh my gosh, this is this has absolutely worked for us. Both of those roles are absolutely awesome. But okay, for us young moms in the, the kid bearing stage right now, um, love your husbands, love your children. The order is so important. Our husbands, they're never going to leave us, God willing, right? <laughs> um, but your children, if you're doing your job right, you're actually working yourself and training yourself out of a job. Um, for so long, it becomes like, mommy, I'm done in the bathroom. And you're like running over to go wipe booties and the season, and then you're mixing pasta the next thing. And then, I mean, you're crazy, right? And so many times husbands fall down on that totem pole. And it's so important to remember that in your home, you get to set the tone of your home. You have the privilege from young to old to set the tone of your home, to be discreet, chase homemakers. When raising kids, we're told that um, these t the days are long and the years are short. And oh my gosh, it's so true. 
we just had our oldest left in August for boot camp. Sorry, totally didn't know I was going to cry. That's fun. Um, <laughs> but it's it's so true. It's They give you the biggest joys of your life, the time where, you know, you're raising them and it's so much fun and you're doing beach days and you're doing, you know, park days and you're crazy and sometimes there's flu and when it goes to your house, it feels like it lasts for three months, but it's been two weeks, which is just about three months in mom math at that point. Um, but in those times, it's so easy to neglect your first ministry. And I remember um, in being told how to set the tone of our home to be affectionate to one another. Let your kids see you kissing in the kitchen. Let your kids see you giving extra long hugs. Dance while you're cooking. I mean, that, that make it fun. And I remember one time we were in our little tiny house in Pomona, which craziest house in the world. It was like a house that was built in the middle of the war. And uh, it was like kitchen sink. Uh, refrigerator, washer, dryer, and there was this about this big of a place in between the stove and the sink, and we were dancing in the middle of it and just kind of playing around, having fun, and Isaac comes running up and just wraps his arms around both of us and looks up, and he was so happy because we were just loving each other, and that's such a huge thing. Date your spouse. Love your husband. Um, my parents have always made this a huge deal. I was super blessed and I was raised with parents that at the age of four, my dad got saved. Um, he was delivered from um, alcoholism and it was a huge transformation that I actually got to see with my own two eyes and I saw my parents marriage transform and it was really, really cool. But date night has been sacred in my parents' house. And so is from when I was a kid to now that we're adults, it was the line, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And that's on every Friday night, and it doesn't matter when. It is like clockwork. They will not, we're not allowed over there. It's just It's just something we do. But um, lastly, in our call as a homemaker, um, for one, like, yeah, make sure that your husband's your priority, raising your kids, and then being submissive in that time. Um, today's world, the word submission is such an ugly word, right? It's like taboo. You're not supposed to say it. And I love this. My sister-in-law, I just love her to death. She sent me this hilarious meme and it said, um, me trying to be a submissive wife after growing up in a feminist world that we live in. And it was this guy saying, he goes, I want guidance. I want leadership, but don't just like boss me around, you know, like lead me, lead me when I'm in the mood to be led. <laughs> and so many times that could be us as women. We want our husbands to lead us. It's beautiful, right? When it's done God's way, but are we willing to submit? Because sometimes we've been taught that that's such a scary word. You know, you're supposed to bow down and just do whatever they say. And that's not actually true. Submission is a really beautiful thing when you see that they're submitting to the Lord and that he is the one that they're bowing down to first. We can posture our heart and submit and take on that role um, where we we are able to come underneath his leadership. And remember that in the times when he's required to lead, it's heavy. Like David's story that he was talking about, um, I, I did tell him and I said it in a way that I was being very serious and at the same time was hoping it would kind of get me to stay next to my niece and nephew for another year. <laughs> and I said, I fully trust that you understand the weight of what you are going to answer to the Lord for with what you do with our family. And that's a very harsh reality, but it's true. He answers to the Lord. He doesn't answer to me. I get the joy of coming underneath his calling or his leadership when he's walking with the Lord. And I love that. But yeah, it is a heavy calling. And um, God requires that a man should lead his home. And for us ladies, when we want to take over that role, remember the curse, okay? In Genesis, the curse is actually that we would want to take that leadership role from him. So when that time comes, you know, last night they were saying, don't take the bait. So in those times where you're thinking, I could do it better, I got that more, I could I could do this so much easier, so much better, um, don't take the bite, not the bait, right? Okay, so just remember, when you're trying to lord over him, don't take the bite, as in the curse. Ha ha, the <laughs> joke, huh? Very funny, honey. Yeah, so funny. <laughs> um, yeah I've, I've met guys who are struggling because they're trying to lead, and their wives want them to lead the way the wives want them to lead. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how to lead me. Like, well, 
I think the Lord will tell me how to lead. Uh, but it's interesting. Okay, so gentlemen, we lead. Number two is you love. And it's all out of 1 Corinthians 5. You're the head of the home, so love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's our second part. So lead and love. If you don't know what biblical, true, honest love looks like, read 1 Corinthians 13. It talks about it perfectly, the things to omit and the things to walk in or to let the Lord work through you. But I think the number one way guys can lead best is to dwell with their wives with understanding. Amen. Right? The best way you can express love, I'm getting claps and an amen from my own wife. Oh my. First uh, Peter chapter three, verse seven, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. And all of us say, Lord, help. Anybody ever unable to understand your, actually, sorry, ladies, how many of you think your husbands have a hard time understanding you? Okay, that's almost all hands. Now, guys, we would confess that it's not always easy. But let me help you out. There's two way, two kinds of understanding. There's understanding what's happening. And then there's understand why it's happening. I don't ever understand the what. But the prayer is, Lord, why? Now, you can be like, oh, I understand that she's mad. Fair enough. But do you understand why? That's the dwelling with understanding. You can understand that maybe there's an insecurity or you can understand that there's a fear or timidity. That's fine. Don't see the surface understanding. The prayer of a husband should be, Lord, where is that coming from? Why is this here? Not just what is here. I think we're all smart enough to see the what. The prayer is in loving our wives, is Lord, why? And uh, leading in love. There's times I know early on, uh, gentlemen, you ever feel like your integrity is getting questioned and you're being attacked as a man? <laughs> you can't question me. I haven't done anything wrong. I remember early on, uh, it, it's never not been this way. She's always had the, the passwords to my phone when phones finally came into existence. <laughs> Uh, but passwords to phones, computers, it's always been there. But I remember she was in a season where she was asking all the time, are you looking at bad things? Are you talking to other girls? Are you like, what? <laughs> I am not looking at anything. I'm not talking to anybody. I am living in honor and integrity. I'm fighting the good fight. My mind and heart are pure. I can't believe she's questioning who I am as a man. <laughs> That's what's going on, on the inside. I don't think I ever <laughs> oh talked to you God, that way. <laughs> No, but on the inside was like rage, insult, personal. But if you dwell with understanding, all she's asking for is like a fleck of assurance. That's it. So now when she asks like, hey, are you looking anything bad? Nope. Okay. And we move on. Don't get so insulted. Love. Christ could be crucified, beat, whipped, and mocked and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so if we're going to lead in love, we're not going to be insulted or take things personal very often. But to lead in love, before we get to the last thing, uh, is to lead in love. I remember when we bought Isaac, right? This makes sense. Now he's out blowing stuff up for the military. But um, he wants to drive a tank. This makes perfect sense now. So I, think, I think I bought him a BB gun a little too early. Yes, a lot too early. Was he five? Yes. Five years old? Six, six. Six. Here's your BB gun. Raw. So men do. And uh, I remember I took him in the backyard, and she came out. I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can. And she wanted to mother the situation. You can't do that. And I had two options. Maybe three. One, cower and let her lead. Fail. Two, two outbursts of wrath. Go back in the house. Leave us alone. <laughs> or three, and this, was, this, this is my first memory of seeing God do something absolutely amazing in our relationship. I'd never saw this before, and I've seen it a million times since. We're sitting out there. He's got his safety glasses on. You can't do that. He's too young. All these reasons, all these mom fears. And we're saying, look, this is going to happen. You can stay and watch, or you can go in the house but this is going to happen. 
fine. It was awesome. She didn't be like, you're so dumb. She didn't flip out. She didn't make me pay for it later. <laughs> she took a deep breath, gave it to the Lord and walked away. And we shot stuff all day long. It was blessed. <laughs> but the power that a gentle answer turns away wrath, that we lead. You don't yield and give up. You lead, gentlemen, but you lead in love. We've got the last two things. We've got to run really quick yeah, yeah, through these, yeah, okay, so okay, okay, good okay, luck. Okay. I'll be fast. Oh, gosh, you guys. I'm going to be 12 shades of purple right now for this one. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Um, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. We're going to talk about the ministry of physical intimacy for our third role as a good wife. Okay. Oh, sorry. I was. Disclaimer. Yeah. I did not ask her to do this. Oh, I really prayed about the three big things to hit on. And this is just something that seriously, as women, we need to own. We need to take our part in. Um, so it is not good that man should be alone, right? Even God, the creator of heaven, earth saw that he had a need for us. Um, and ladies, you need to. So we're just going to talk, okay? Because here's the thing is we live in a day and age where this is so perverted, it's so twisted, and it is so wrong, and it's completely left the big biblical model for physical intimacy between a husband and a wife, which is a beautiful thing, and we shouldn't be embarrassed of it. That's just part of the curse, too, which totally stinks. But um, in think about it if you can. You have this beautiful power to purify and to bond your marriage together. And that is through becoming one with your husband. In dating, think about it. Satan has done everything possible in a dating relationship to get the two to come together as one before they said, I do. And the second that you say, I do, he does everything in his power to keep you apart in the marriage bed. Okay. Intimacy purifies your relationship. It strengthens you. It bonds you together as a couple. And you, wife, are the only person on the face of the planet that can do this for your husband, okay? It is not to be used as a tool. It's not to be used as a weapon. It's not to be dangled to get the new purse or the new shoes. That's called prostitution. When you get something and you, when you're, I'll give you this, but you gotta give me this. I mean, come on, think about it, right? That is basically what it is. So dang, don't dangle it, don't. That, does, that doesn't go over well, right? Um, we're a helpmate. It is our job to be a blessing. And that includes in the way of intimacy. Don't always have a headache. He needs you. Um, as a homemaker, you set the tone of your home. Is he extra cranky? He needs you. <laughs> um, guys are pretty black and white. And this is not to diminish. This is how God created it. Someone told us, men are simple. They need a sandwich or they need sex. And sometimes that's just the truth. Sometimes they need food in their bellies and sometimes they just need an extra special hug from their husband or for them, from their wives, not their husband. Oh my gosh. Oh. That was bad. Um, but anyways, so ladies, as expected, you, and okay, here's the, my other little thing, since we have to rush, I'll skip something. But, um, one, one thing. The most I get this. Important. This is the this is the thing. They get it. Okay, so ladies, just like you would be horrified if your husband was continually watching porn and he was comparing you to this unrealistic, unattainable, fake, um, fake whatever stigma that people. They just, they watch it too much, and it becomes this thing, and it's ruined relationship, it's ruined marriages, but. For us, ladies, we think that our stuff is so innocent. It's snowing outside. I'm cuddling on my couch with my blanket and my hot cocoa. And I'm going to watch every Hallmark Christmas movie there is on the planet. And I'm going to be so upset that my husband doesn't have a great aunt that sent us millions of dollars and passed away that I didn't know about. And now I don't get the farm and I don't get the things. You can set unrealistic expectations for your husband with these silly romantic movies. So don't set unrealistic expectations for him just like you would want him to set unrealistic expectations for you. So in 
this, our job is to be the helpmate, the homemaker, just at the tone of our home and the job of, phys- of the ministry of intimacy. And our ultimate goal is that we finish well, that we be like some of these couples here that have these long lasting marriages. I'm sorry. I love you guys. I saw you guys worshiping together and I'm like, I love that they're here at a marriage conference, a sweet old couple that I want that to be yes one day. So I'm just so excited. Yeah. Anyways, I'm done. All right. Yep, there she is. And so this will be short and to the point. Gentlemen, lead, love, and the last thing is die. You have to die. It won't work any other way. It's out of Ephesians 5. You're the head of the house. Love her like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What you want is irrelevant. It's what the Lord wants, that he's entrusted to your care. And oftentimes I think we forget that Jesus went to the garden to pray so that he could have the power to die. Lord, let this cup pass if there's any other way. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Without the prayer in the garden, I'm not sure the cross would have happened. And so our job is to be so close to our Heavenly Father that if need be, we could crucify our own desires to cover the heart and mind of our wife. And out of that dying will bring life. So we read in Psalms, she'll be like a fruitful vine. Your home will flourish if you feed and water it the right things. Sometimes people don't die well, right? They don't lead because they love themselves. Well, I'm not going to have this confrontational conversation because I don't feel like dealing with it. You don't love her. You love you. You don't want to deal with difficulty, so you don't do it. That's self-preservation. Or even the other day, there's, like, we've had so many TV wars like, remember when The Bachelor and Bachelorette came out like a billion years ago? Oh, yeah. I'm like, what? This disgusting show? Oh my gosh. Who goes and dates 20 ladies and then picks one? And then what's this whole like evening of rope? You can forego the something sweet thing. This is trash. Mm-hmm. And people have to talk me back into to some version of calm. But there's times where you have to step out and make a stance that perhaps isn't popular. But if you just yield to them rather than him, you don't actually love him in the first place. And others don't die well because it is all about what they want. It's getting what they desire. And so be very, very careful. Uh, Ladies, I'll let you know right now, leading is one of the most wild experiences of a man's life. Because simultaneously... They're trying to discern and dwell with understanding you and your kids and their job. And they're trying to, at the same time, crucify their own desires and hear from heaven all at the same time. Pray for your husband. And gentlemen, get to the garden so that in the moments you have to crucify the flesh and die for your bride, you can. Lead, love them, and die to yourself, that Christ may dwell in you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that no matter how deep the valleys have ever been, they weren't so low you could not reach. No one's out of reach. No marriage is irrecoverable. And so, Lord, do something amazing. Lord, bring us back to just being rooted and grounded in you. In Jesus' name, amen.